Welcome to FaithWorks, the enlightening and empowering program that builds your faith to help you overcome every single challenge in this life. My name is Kaude Adeshoga. I'm your host. I want you to sit back, listen, and be blessed. God bless you. Now, we have to trust God. Um, last week, Sunday, I said um, why we must trust God, and I gave some outlines because some of them make it absolutely necessary where we have no option but to trust God. But today we're looking at what it means to trust God. What do you need to do to prove that you trust God? Faith towards God is an elementary doctrine in Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1. It talks about an elementary doctrine, but that's where we start from. God wants you to trust him, but more importantly, God wants you to trust his word and God wants you to trust the kingdom that he has deposited in your life. And that's why in the book of Exodus, when they got to the edge of the Red Sea, Moses cried out to God and God reprimanded him. I said, why do you cry out to me? Why are you praying to me? Now, use the rod in your hand. Begin to have faith in the rod in your hand. That rod in your hand is the kingdom of God. Have faith in it. Don't call on me. When Jesus was in the boat and there was a storm, he didn't call on God. He didn't pray. Just say, peace be still. And that's where God is taking us to. But we don't start from there. We start by trusting God, which is for babies. So what I'm sharing this morning, actually, it's... Um, it's more like an elementary doctrine which we must imbibe and learn so that we can mature into the deeper things of God. We call it the meat of God where we can exhibit our trust in the abilities of God that is inside of us. So we said in Proverbs chapter 3, which is my main text again this morning, Proverbs chapter 3, I'll be reading from verse 5 to 6. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge God and he shall direct your path. And this is very, very important for a time like this when the COVID-19 has short-circuited not just income, but it has short-circuited means by which people are acquainted to for making incomes. And God is opening channels that they're not acquainted to and still giving them the required target and surpassing it. But it comes by trusting God, not leaning to your own methods, depending on God's method and following them. That's what Proverbs chapter 3 from verse 4 to uh, from verse 5 to 6 says. Now also in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is in the Old Testament. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah chapter 17, and I'll read from verse, i read from verse 5. It says, Cursed be the man that trusted in man. So if you don't trust God and you trust in man, that means you are cursed. Now, I don't think anyone wants to be cursed. So it's important to know the difference between trusting God and trusting man. Here the Bible says, cursed. The word cursed means divinely empowered to retrogress in life, not to move forward again. That's not a good word at all. Cursed is the man that trusts in man and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departed from the Lord. You know, in the book of, um, now here he's saying, for trusting man, you have departed from the Lord. And I think it's the book of Hebrews, calls it evil not to trust God. To trust man is evil. So because sometimes what you consider is evil is theft, adultery, but God says not trusting me is evil. Trusting man is evil. There are people who trust a political leader. There are people who trust only their pastor. They don't trust God, but they trust their pastor. There are people who trust 
an uncle who is a director in a top company somewhere, you know, and they don't trust God. Now, he says that man will be like a half in the desert, my goodness, and he shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit patched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. Now, that doesn't sound good. It looks like a grievous crime, but it is a grievous crime not to trust God. There are only two places that God swore in the Bible. When Abraham trusted God enough to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, God said, by myself I swear. And in the book, that's in the book of Genesis. And in the book of Numbers, when God told the children of Israel to enter the promise, and they said, we are not able because we don't have the means. They trusted in their ability and they fell. And God said, I swear by myself, by myself, none of you will enter. Those are the two places God swore displaying extreme emotions of anger and pleasure. The anger, he swore they will not enter. The pleasure, he swore to give humanity to the seed of Abraham. And both were a display of one trusting God and the other trusting, not trusting God. So it's a serious issue. Then in verse 7, he said, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is, for it shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spread out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes. Now we're in a time of heat, we're in a time of famine, we're in a time of scarcity. But those who trust God will not even know such is happening. But their leaves shall be green and they shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall they cease from yielding fruit. So the difference between the profitable and the profitable now is who trusts God and who trusts man. Praise the Lord. Now, the issue now is how do I trust God or how do I know that what I'm doing is a proof that I trust God? Now, if you trust God, number one, your mind will be not on the crisis you're facing, but on the ability of God to deliver you from the crisis you're facing. It is not a denial of the crisis you're facing, but it is resting your mind on the ability of God to save you. There's barely any human being, even the president of the most powerful nation in the world, in fact, they seem to have more crisis than other people. There's barely any human being in this life that does not have one crisis or the other he's facing. Every human being has one aspect of their life that they're looking up to God for an intervention for. Now, for those who trust God, they are not thinking of that crisis, though they have not denied the crisis exists. But they are thinking on God and his ability and his faithfulness to deliver them from the crisis. Now let's start with Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. Now Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, I'll read from verse 3 to 4. Isaiah 26, 3 to 4. It says, Thou wilt keep whosoever in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, O Lord. Why? Because he trusted in thee. Isaiah 26 verse 3. It says you will keep the man whose mind is on thee. Now the people, people's mind is on different things. Some's mind is on money. Some people's mind is on their rent that is coming. And that's all they are thinking. Some people, their mind is on an ailment. The doctor has said this ailment, they've diagnosed a problem. And some people, their mind is on a challenge in their marriage and their mind is on it. And how do you know their mind is on it? They're always talking about it. Every time they meet somebody, that's what they talk about. Even if they're in a private discussion with something else and, you know, maybe they're talking about football and they're talking about Manchester United and Arsenal and their mind is on their marriage and something happens, they say flop or maybe somebody didn't kick the ball well. And let's say they say, oh, it's just like that, my stupid husband. Or oh, that my useless wife. That's how he did the other time. He was supposed to draw. I just remember when I saw the way they were kicking. Their mind is on that crisis. 
they are not trusting God. The Bible says they will end up like a patch in the wilderness in life because they're not trusting God. If they are trusting God, when such issues come up, they say, well, it's not that we're not facing something similar, but I know. Then they tell you what they believe God will do. They tell you what they trust God that he will accomplish. And that's what they keep talking about because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So you keep saying it because your mind is stayed on it. Now, in, I, I want to look at a few scriptures. I'll go to um, Psalm 112, Psalm 112. And then I'll look at verse 7. Psalm 112, Psalm verse 7. He says, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He's not afraid of the storm. His heart is fixed. He's fixed on what? On God, on his abilities. I remember in the book of Daniel, and... Um, the king, I, I guess, has made a decree and the three Hebrew men refused to bow down to the golden image. He made a golden image and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to the golden image. I guess those are the names. And the king told them, I'm giving you one opportunity to bow to my golden image and they refused. So he told the, um, they were to cast into the furnace of fire so he told the man hitting the furnace to hit it seven times the more. Now the man hitting the furnace got killed from the heat, hitting it seven times the more. Now the king hitting the furnace seven times the more now was trying to give them the... They said, no, 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 no. Don't you even think about it. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't say, oh, King. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. They called him by name. They said, the God will serve. They were not denying it has been hit seven times more, but they were not considering that thing. The God will serve, can, will deliver us. Paraventure, he chooses not to deliver us. They were not talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. They were not talking about the Lord. They were talking about their God. They said our God, paraventure, he chooses not. We will still not bow. The focus was their God. They were not talking, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we can see you have heated the fire. It's seven times more. It has killed your servant. And the heat is, no, they were not even talking about the fire. It was not an issue. And they were not talking about the king because they didn't use the word, oh, king. They said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. He was not an issue. The issue was their God. Meaning their heart is fixed on God. Those are men that are trusting God. And that's how you to know whether you're trusting God. In Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4. Now, here is Abraham. And the Bible says that um, Romans 4, I read from verse 17. God, in, I told Abraham, as it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Now God told Abraham, you are now the father of many nations. He didn't say, but my organs are dead. He didn't talk about his organs. And he didn't talk about Sarah's womb that was dead. There were no issues. They were not to be considered. They were not relevant to what was before him. And they were not denied. He didn't say, I reject it. No, they were not rejected. That's a wrong, the word I reject is not a faith term. It's not a terminology for those that trust God. It's a natural term. It's not in the spiritual. They don't recognize it in the spiritual. I reject it. No. Even when the, the Goliath told David he would kill him, David didn't say, I reject it. David pronounced what he would do, which bound what Goliath said and capped it and swallowed Goliath's words, which were words of death because life swallowed death straight away. I reject it. It's neither life or deeds. Even is a no man's land. God will not show up for the man. Satan will not help the man. So that's a no man's land. So here, 
God was telling Abraham at age 100, you're going to have a son. And the Bible says in verse 19, be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When it was about 100 years, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't look at the fact, he knew his organs were dead, he knew Sarah's womb were dead, but he didn't consider it to be an issue to be discussed. Somebody may come and say, do you know in this pandemic we have not worked? If you talk to a man that trusts God, he is not going to do as if he even heard what you said. He's going to ask, have you sought God to find out the avenue he wants you to bless you? He's not going to reiterate, oh, you have not worked? You know that two of you don't trust God. Those are two elements that have no trust in God. Really, if I is only you, if I my auntie, that one is even worse. There are peace. No, those are elements of Men in the desert, patches, dwelling in dry places that are unfruitful. When you say, do you know I have not walked since March? A man that trusts God can ask, how have you been feeding? He wants to know how God has sustained you. So how has God sustained you? Say, begging, well, you don't have to beg. Why don't you ask God to show you other venues by which you can make money? There's another pathway that you have not seen. Ask him, he will show you. That's a man. He's not denying that he has not worked. He's just telling him that let God open you through another channel where you can make money. So it's not I reject it. It is a pronouncement that, amen, that is showing the ability of God superimposing on the weakness and the deadness and the crisis on ground. Do you desire to live and operate God's way of doing things? Do you desire to understand how faith works? Fundamentals of Faith is a book written by Coyote Adishoga. It teaches in simple terms how to operate the God kind of faith that helps you overcome all hurdles of life. Fundamentals of Faith is available for purchase at Trem Bookshop Obani Koro Lagos and Bible Wonderland Stadium Suruleri Lagos. Get a copy today. So when a man trusts God, his mind is fixed on God, on his faithfulness, on his ability. Remember Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. And God, in verse 2, the earth was without form and void. And God came, God saw the darkness. Do you know when Adam fell, God saw it. The Bible says he killed the lamb that would save Adam before Adam was created. So he saw Adam's fall. But he didn't discuss Adam's fall. He said, Adam, where are you? It was Adam in a falling state that was saying he's naked. He can't do this. He can't do God said, oh, really? Have you eaten the fruit I told you not to eat? God doesn't discuss such things. He discusses solutions. He discusses the answer. He doesn't discuss the crisis. And so when a man is discussing crisis, it's a proof he does not trust God. And he will end up in the patch places. But I trust God we will know from what you say. Amen. So, number one proof that you trust God is that your heart is fixed on God. Amen. Number two, if you trust God, you will fear nothing in this life. You will not be afraid of Boko Haram. You will not be afraid of terrorists. You will not be afraid of kidnappers. Now, you will not walk without caution, without any security caution, as if, no, 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 no. You're not going to bed and leave your doors open. No, that is tempting God. Because that's what Satan was trying to make Jesus do at the temptation when he took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, jump, for it is written. Angels will catch you. You don't say because angels will catch you, you go and jump. No, 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 no. You don't say because God is watching you, you leave your doors open. In Psalm 127, it says, Except the Lord build the house, the labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord watches over the city, the watchman or the security man stays awake in vain. So the fact that you trust God does not mean you shouldn't have a security man watching your house. That doesn't mean you shouldn't subscribe to your neighborhood security and pay for security in your neighborhood. You don't say, oh, we don't need the gates. We don't need any security. God, no, 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 no. But when you trust God, your confidence is not in the security man at the gate. Your confidence is in God who can use the security man to protect you. 
So if you trust God, you will fear nothing, nothing, and absolutely nothing in this life. Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12, and I read verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength, my song. He also is become my salvation. Meaning, you will not be afraid of anything. It's actually even clear in the word. You should not be afraid of those who can kill the body. But you should fear only God who can kill both body and soul. It says, fear not them who can kill the body. Praise the Lord. So, if you trust God, you not live in fear. Now, when I drive, I lock my car, especially in traffic. I lock the doors because I don't want somebody just opening the door. But I'm not afraid that anybody can hurt me. Now, I don't go out late in the night unnecessarily, except there's an emergency. I've been called like 1 a.m., and I had to go and attend to an emergency at 1 a.m. But I don't go out at 1 a.m. I don't even go out at 9 p.m., except it's necessary I'm out there. So if I have to be there, I'm out there, but I don't go out just playing, driving, saying, no, God is my, I fear nothing. No, 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 no. If you do that, you are tempting God. And that is a crisis that can empower Satan to get rid of that person. And so you display a security consciousness without being afraid of the ability of the enemy to get you. Meaning, you secure your door, but you don't keep staying awake and say, huh. Oh, you know, there are people who can't sleep because they're afraid. They're afraid of one sound or the other. No, you sleep well. He giveth his beloved sleep. There's a security mandate. Yeah. There's a door lock. Yeah. There's an iron gate. All right. Another gate. Okay. Praise God. There are people who have 11 gates to get to them. Just an ordinary apple took them out. They didn't need a bullet fire. So if God will save you, he will save you. If he will not save you, he will not save you. If you like, have 21 gates. But don't be afraid. And at the same time, don't let your confidence be in the machinery that has been set up to protect you, but the ability of the Almighty God to protect you. There have been so many occasions, and I know people have different testimonies of different occasions where God has protected them, where God has kept them. I remember once I was working with a few um, group of people. I was then in my secondary school years back, and we were working on the road. And I just said, please, I need us to walk faster. They said, where are you rushing to? About six of us, where are you rushing to? I said, I just feel I need to walk faster. We normally we were all just in, walking from the hostel to the, um, uh, from the classroom to the hostel. They said, you are the one, you can go, you can be in. So I just left them, and I walked faster to the hostel. And not long I got to the hostel, I was hearing gunshots. And Robert just cornered them, robbed all of them. Now God protected me. He kept me from that. Now, my trust is in him. My confidence is in him. My hope is in him. My life is in him. And he has means by which he intervenes, by which he saves. I remember once my sister car broke down on the Todd Millan Bridge. Just before the car broke down, the Holy Spirit told me, pray. Pray, just about an hour. And I prayed for like 15 minutes. And I had peace, and he said, and he said, the evil, the disaster is about it. So she now called me that the car broke down, that the battery went off. So I carried the battery, and I went to meet her. And while we we're trying to pull the battery, now there was this governor who was traveling, and they had a convoy, and one of the tires of the convoy carrying the security men went flat. So the go the, the 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 jeep parked about just about ten feet from where we were, and the Mopop men. They were in the car, they came down, so they were trying to change the tire. So the governor went on, I guess, was going to the airport. So while we're trying to change the battery, this bike came, about one or two of them, brought out guns and said they were going to rob us. I said, Who the hell do you think you are? And while the guy cocked the gun, the other guy told him, say, Look at those mopo, look at those mopo, let us go quickly, let's go, let's go, let's go, jump, 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 jump. They just jumped and they, they, they ran away. So go use those security men to protect us. I get was that prayer that the angel just punched up one of those tires of those convoy, knowing that those guys were going to come there to rob. And God protects, and he protects in diverse ways. But your confidence must be in God. You must not be afraid. Don't go around saying, I'm robbers. 
arm robbers. Don't be arm robbers conscious. Be God conscious. Don't be thieves, kidnappers conscious. Be what? God conscious. You must not be afraid. In Psalm 56, Psalm 56, not Psalm 54. Psalm 56, then I read verse 4. And it says, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. And if you go to verse 11, it repeats it again. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do to me. So you don't fear anybody. You respect people, but you don't, you're not afraid of anyone. I remember once I was working at Yaba, or so it was Yaba. I just got saved about two months in the Lord. And this masquerade, they were using a cane, chasing people all over, people were running. And I don't know... <laughs> They came to us and said, oh, with this cake. And I raised eyes and I said, I said, eh, what, what? And he raised his hand and said, oh, oh, oh. And then brought it down and went away quietly. I just was not afraid of him. I guess he needed to see fear to continue to exhibit his folly. I was just not afraid. And um, I remember once I was driving on, it was towards the Jewel Legba then, on the corridor, it was a joy like that. And we're in the traffic, and I saw this guy with leaves. And he had this calabash in his hand. I think there was water. And people say, I've heard it. I don't know how true it is. That water was not touch people. So I was in an airport. So I mean, I just went down the glass. I just went down. Because the last person I saw with leaves that I read about is Adam in the Garden of Eden. They covered himself with leaves. That God had to remove the leaves and use animal skin to cover him. In this day and age, wearing leaves. So he came and said, hey, give me money. I said, come. I said, this day I need you. are using leaves. You are not even ashamed of yourself. You are a disgrace to humanity. Using leaves to cover yourself. He looked at me. He said, leave me, Jale. I need money. <laughs> and he continued on his journey. I was not afraid. There was nothing. I can't afraid what man can do. Don't fear me. Don't look. Don't be afraid of anybody. If he likes, let him carry fire on his head. He's a human being. He's not God. I believe you have been blessed by that message. And I know your faith has been built up. And I know all those challenges in life are all going to fall before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You need him in this walk. And so if you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, I want you to say after me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only begotten Son of God. Come into my life, be my Lord. And my savior is as simple as that displayed on the screen is diverse information or how you can interact and reach out to us take advantage of it and i'll be expecting to hear from you till i come your way again same time next week i want to tell you don't give up faith works it's working and it will work in your life god bless you